Welcome to Inside Chips, the podcast that keeps you up to speed on the fast-moving world of semiconductors. I'm your host, Gregory Haley, Technology Editor with Semiconductor Engineering, and every week we'll bring you the breakthroughs, the deals, and the science shaping the chip industry. Let's welcome Ed Sperling, our Editor-in-Chief. Hi, Ed. What's uh, the big news happening in the semiconductor industry from last week? There are several topics. One of the top ones that I've seen is the move toward chipwits. It still is continuing. So in the past, a lot of this was being done by the largest companies, and it's still being done by the largest companies. But there's a lot more development that's starting to happen around the edges. You think about standard ways to connect this stuff all together, the standards that follow with that as well. All of this is starting to take form and this, we assume that this will start becoming essential as we move into 3D ICs and potentially 3.5D ICs, depending upon how people actually put these things together. One of the big challenges there has been the sharing of IP or the protection of IP in terms of getting these chips to speak to one another and, and what the companies are willing to share. And I don't see that going away anytime soon. What they are trying to do now is figure out a way to control the data flow so that you only get just enough information for what you need to be able to put these things together. The standards will help for sure. So things like UCIE and a bunch of wires certainly will help in, in those respects. We're also probably going to see, my guess is, instead of a full design all your chiplets or pull them all from the marketplace, maybe you have 80% of it done and here's your choices. And you've got some standard ways of doing this. So you, you're going after a specific market. You'll be able to use these choices from this foundry or this OSAT. If you're going after a different market, you use a whole different set of them potentially. But the bigger issue for chiplets right now, especially at the leading edge is how do you test, especially for some of these advanced nodes? And that's going to continue because these things are being put together in a way that they've never been put together before. The processes that are being used here are very immature. So it's going to take time. We're going to see a lot more redundancy in these. It's, but this is basically what was done on all the advanced notes for years anyway. We're thinking about the restrictive design rules. Those have always been in place and they've always been at the expense of performance or power or just so that you can be sure that this chip is going to work when it comes out the door because it, it doesn't work. Neither the OSAT or the foundry is going to make money. Let's talk a little bit now about uh, the Chip Security Act changes and what's happening uh, in terms of international trade. That's really interesting. We're starting to see advanced chips showing up in places that we never saw them before. So India has been talking about building fabs for, I think, almost 25 years at this point. They finally seem to be getting it their act together. We're going to see a lot more chips coming out of places like India. They're actually going to design them and develop them there. We're seeing uh, centers of excellence showing up there. In the past, it was pretty much they would do verification. They would write some of the software that was used inside, and that was about as far as it went. They're actually developing hardware now, and they're developing the software that goes with it. The other big one that's, that's a real surprise here is what's going on in the Middle East. So they've been talking about this for a long time. They have always wanted to have a backup because they think oil is probably going to peter out at some point in the future, but that's been pushed back decade after decade. So I'm not sure that when that actually will run out, but at the same time, they need some stability in order to build a whole different type of economy. And so this is really what they're investing in very heavily. They've been doing this in places like the UAE probably since the early part of the millennium here. So that, that's nothing new, but what they're really pushing now is a whole different level of technology that they've never had before. I think the world, especially some of these governments in places where they can see things transforming in terms of our energy infrastructure uh, and, and the need for uh, economic change, is how much artificial intelligence is having an impact on things like economy and things even from government to manufacturing to robotics. It really is going to be uh, the way countries move forward in the future. So not too surprised to see these countries that have a lot of cash on hand putting money into what seems to be the wave of the future. I'm also really interested in this part of the deal with Saudi Arabia that has to do with, with rare earth elements. You know, lithium is something that comes out of salt brines and deserts, and Saudi Arabia certainly has a lot of those. The entire supply chain has been thrown into a tizzy with this trade war that's been going on between the U.S. and China. There doesn't seem to be any relaxing of the tensions and the escalation up to 165% tariffs and then down to 30%, which is what it was originally supposed to be, really hasn't changed anything here. 
you have an issue of two countries that are trying to figure out where they work together and where they don't work together. And that really has not been decided at this point. But what's also changing now is if you can't get some of the core materials, some of the rare earths in particular, out of a place with enough concentrations and where they're already doing the environmentally destructive type of processing, then where do you get them? And you need to find new sources. That's really part of what's underlying what's going on here. In order to have a stable economy going forward and one that is strategically tied into just about everything in defense, you need to be at the leading edge of technology. The U.S. has been been there for years. Europe has been there for years. China is a newcomer in this area, and they've done a really effective job over the past 20 years of building that up. But the materials that enable that are in certain places and not others. And you need to figure out, okay, do we need to use those or can we potentially get alternatives as well? You bring up China. I think that's a really important story from this last week as well. This idea of the when changing the export controls, moving it away necessarily from the wholesale country and to specific companies. It's uh, specifically about the Huawei Ascend chips uh, for the export controls. And that could change the way that trading and, and the negotiations go in terms of what chips can be shipped and what equipment can be shipped. And so that's going to be an interesting adjustment. And this brings up the whole topic of traceability, because one of the issues about determining who's using whose chips and which chips from American companies are showing up in other people's equipment ties back into this whole issue of traceability. And that's part of the chiplet conversation. That's part of the yield and performance in the field. And this is not something that has I think, been resolved yet, but I think it's going to have to be. This has been going on for decades. Uh, I'm not convinced it ever will be solved simply because there's so many potential back doors for where do you buy your stuff? Where do you sell it? Where do you ship it from? Can you move it from one country to another? We're seeing this certainly out of Taiwan to Malaysia and then back to China at this point for some of the advanced chips that are being developed. We're also seeing probably a, a much higher level of IP theft than we've ever seen before because the Everybody's capable of finding this stuff at this point. You can use LLMs to track down data all the way across the uh, internet into places that you really don't even know about. That's an important point about the tariffs going up and down. The semiconductor industry doesn't do particularly well with instability, especially when you're ordering chips as much as a year out for products that you have coming online, not even knowing how much they're going to cost because the, there's no predictability in the tariff right now. You know, there's another piece of this too, which is that everybody's focused on the most advanced node chips, but really what slowed down a lot of the supply chain during the pandemic and right afterward and what left all these cars on the on the lots that were unsaleable is had to do with a lot of the older technology. So 200 millimeter, where are we going to get this 200 millimeter capacity when everybody only wants to build the most advanced nodes? That's an issue right now, even with the CHIPS Act, all of the big facilities going in in Arizona and Ohio, even in Oregon here, uh, the advancements, they're looking at adding EUV lines. And 90% you know, of the chips sold in the world come off of old 200 nanometer and you know even 193 immersion, and those lines are reducing. And there's no answer right now to the solution, the supply chain solution when it comes to older node chips. They can be produced on 300 millimeter lines. The problem is that everybody has to go through that. They need to change the equipment. They need to change some of the processes. Nobody wants to do that because the stuff's already established. And putting an investment into this, you've got depreciated equipment already in a lot of these older fabs. You can't compete with that on price. Will tariffs take care of that? Probably not. I think you're still going to see this kind of battling back and forth of, oh, we have all this capacity, but you can't use it. Now, that's an interesting point about changing out lines. You know, the facilities they're building now are so completely integrated from top to bottom that, you know, making a change in a line or making a change in a process is more difficult than it is in an older fab. But that's uh, that's going to be a challenge they'll have to overcome if they want to eventually catch up with the demand for these older node chips. Yeah, this is like another seg segment of raw materials for electronic devices. If you don't have this supply chain and you can't get the hold of these chips and the capacity in order to make them, you've got some serious problems, even if you can make the most advanced chips. Thanks, Ed. And thanks to our audience for tuning in today. For more news and information on the semiconductor industry, you can check out semiengineering.com. I'm your host, Gregory Haley, and we'll see you on the next spin.